Welcome to Interview Coder 2.0. We spent the past few months working with the best engineers from around the world to build the most undetectable platform for lead code interviews out there right now. We went through every single major testing platform, have bought accounts set up on every single testing site, and have even talked to staff engineers from every single one of the top testing platforms to build the most undetectable platform out there. I'm really excited to share with you the new platform and show you how it works. Let's first walk through some of the features that we've had, improved, and added. The feature that I'm most excited to show is the audio feature. So now Interview Coder works perfectly Perfectly, even when there's questions being asked that are completely verbal and have nothing to do with the screen. Interview Coder 1.0 fully relied on the tool answering the lead code question that was visible on the screen, but it failed when questions were asked verbally and it couldn't respond to that. When we tried to add it before, there were a lot of errors and every single current implementation of audio has a very, very poor implementation of the actual transcription coming from the interviewer themselves. Due to system audio uh, being captured, they have a much, much dumber model that's not able to answer questions at the same accuracy that Interview Coder was once able to. We've this by adding an agentic workflow such that audio questions are processed separately from questions on the screen and using the top models that are fine-tuned by our engineers to have exact answers to that trained off the leak code databases for all interview questions, including anything system design, anything related time complexity, and all verbal questions. So now Interview Coder completely supports all audio questions that are explained only verbally as well as questions on the screen. Next thing we've added is one of our biggest features is Interview Coder is now no longer visible in the activity monitor. This is one of the biggest feature requests and one of the things that there's no other platform in the world that actually gets right. But when now, when you actually search up Interview Coder in any of your applications folders, you will not be able to find it. When you're in the middle of an interview and someone asks you, hey, can you search up Interview Coder in your applications to see if it's there? They absolutely will not be able to find it. This is because we've changed the name to a random process name, uh, something like System Activity Recorder, it's just something that we randomly change every once in a while to make sure that it's never ever detectable. We've changed the icon, so when you are using Interview Coder, absolutely nobody will be able to know except you. And of course, we have some of our flags features that have been persistent since the V1 and we've continued improving on to this day. The most prominent being it's invisible to screen share. So very few softwares out there actually get this right. You cannot have this in a browser extension. Uh, you cannot have this in most implementations of other cheating softwares online, but we have the best undetectability to screen share out of any desktop application right now. You can go ahead and test it right now. You can download Interview Coder, try to share your screen on a Google Meet and see if it, see if it works. We have a custom process that hijacks at the operating system level and actually makes it so that there's absolutely no system that can detect that Interview Coder is running or that you're using Interview Coder at all. We use the same technology that super high security softwares for like password management you will use to make sure that when you share your screen and you have private passwords on your application, these will not be shared. So that's the exact technology that we're using here. The next thing we have that no other competitor has is complete click-through technology. So what this means is when you're hovering on an application on a browser and you're on a coder pad or a hacker rank and your mouse is moving to a different tab, the browser can actually detect that your mouse has left the tab that you're currently in and it will notify the interviewer that your mouse has left the tab. This is true right now for every single one of our competitors and Interview Coder is the only one that has complete click-through undetectability. You can even feel in the UI when you hover over any button on Interview Coder, there will actually be nothing that you can do because Interview Coder finally relies on global shortcuts. This is the only way to interact with the platform. We don't use hotkeys. We don't use anything that could be registered by the browser. Every single one of our commands is a global shortcut that is at the operating system level and completely undetectable by the browser. The way that you can test this out right now is you can go to any website that tracks keyboard events, mouse events, or anything like that. Try to open your spotlight search with a command and space, or if you're on Mac, try to do any sort of global shortcut that opens up anything, and you'll notice that these shortcuts actually get intercepted by the operating system and go completely undetected by the browser. So these are some of our flagship undetectability features, and we're super excited to roll out audio, we're super excited to roll out undetectability to system monitoring, and we're very excited that we have the best undetectability features in the planet, which is why we've bumped the price to interview coder significantly to reflect we're the only system right now that is completely undetectable to all current testing softwares. You can also check right now that we're undetectable to the software that you're interested in. We have a full video repository of, of successful people having used Interview Coder, which again is something that none of our competitors have. If you ever have an example in an interview or you have anything at all that you need to use Interview Coder for and you want to test that it works on a specific platform, we almost certainly have a video showing proof that Interview Coder does work. So you can look through our video gallery if, you, if you're curious if there's any platform that Interview Coder doesn't work on. Now let's jump in an interview and I'll show you how Interview Coder actually works live. Hey Abdullah, good to meet you. I'm excited to do the interview today. Hey Roy, good to see you as well. Yeah, I guess we can just jump right into the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, here's a question. Give a string s, find the length of the longest substring without the duplicate characters. 
Okay, so um, I guess I'll just read the problem out loud and sort of like figure out what you're trying to ask of me here. It's like I'm given an example string and you want me to find the longest consecutive non-repeating substring. Okay, so this question is pretty general, but I think I understand it. Let me just clarify this. So consecutive means the characters are back to back and the substring doesn't actually break, right? So ABC is a substring, CDE is a substring, and DEF are all substrings? Yeah, sure. Okay, and does the entire string count as a substring? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, sure, that makes it pretty simple then. Um, so I guess we are looking for the longest subsequence inside this string. So a continuous subsequence is like a, a splicing of the string at a specific start and end, and we're looking to make sure that none of the characters in that substring are repeated. Yeah, you should not uh, repeat it. Okay, I think we can use a technique here called the sliding window technique. This is an algorithm where you sort of have like a left pointer and a right pointer that sort of get moved incrementally, and you iterate the right pointer and the left pointer according to the right pointer to make sure that the implementation is um, correct at every single point. And for every single right pointer, you sort of find the furthest possible left pointer such that the subsequence is still valid. Uh, so let me, let me just map out what I think we can do to try and solve the problem. So I guess there's a few things that we'll need. First, we'll need a right pointer pointing to the right end of the substring that we're interested in. Then we'll have a left pointer pointing to the left end. We'll also have a global max variable because we want to find the max length and we need to store this somewhere. So we'll just have a, a random variable for that. To so make sure that there's nothing that's repeated I guess what we can denote as repeating is something that shows up twice. We want a data structure such that we can make sure that no character in that substring shows up twice. I guess we can use something like a hash map or uh, even more simply like a hash set. Um, so we'll, we'll have a set of all the characters that we've seen in the substring split between left and right. And we'll make sure that if there are any repetitions of characters, we can sort of like move the left pointer up until there are no more repetitions. Does that make sense? Yeah, you got it. Okay, great. Then I think I can just go ahead and start implementing. Maybe I'll write some pseudocode and then I'll write, I'll write the actual code later. So I guess we'll start by having this global max length. We'll just call this res and we'll return this at the very end. We can sort of iterate through the entire length of the string. We'll let right be the, the pointer that we use to increment. So for every single iteration, we'll have the right be incremented to the next possible right. And during that whole time, we'll try and have left be updated to the furthest possible left for that right. This works because, you know, like it has to be consecutive. So there's no possibility that there is like a non-valid substring, a valid substring separated by an invalid character followed by another valid substring. That wouldn't be in, in its entirety a valid substring because it has to be consecutive necessarily. But what I like to do personally is I like to do while invalid, sort of like increment the left one until it is valid and then do the global update on the new valid string. So I guess we'll say while the character at the right index of the string, so SS at index R is in the set, that's like the invalid case. If it exists in the set, that means we've seen it before in the current substring, then we will uh, increment our left up by one and we'll pop what was previously in the left. We'll remove that out of the string. This is a O of one operation. And we'll do that over and over and over again until we get to the point where the right index character is no longer in the set. Okay, great. Now we have a valid string and what we can do is we can say that the length of this valid string is uh, right minus left plus one. If it's just, just length one, then it would be one. They're these pointing at the same index, it would be length one, just that one character, so on and so forth. So we can globally update our max res variable, but we'll just do like a quick like math on max kind of thing. We'll let the new res be equal to the max of the existing res and right minus left plus one, which is the length of the current valid substring. And that's pretty much it. I guess we can just do that for the loop. Now we sort of have all the checks that we need. Every single right, we increment the left such that it becomes a valid substring. And once we have a valid substring, then we can just take the max between that and the current max. And at the end, we'll just return the current max. Okay, yeah, I think that's it. Well, we can just return res and I'm pretty happy with that solution. Can you please talk about the time complexity and the space complexity? Yeah, sure, I can talk a little bit about the complexity. So the time complexity for most sliding window operations are just O of N. In the worst case, we're just iterating through the entire length of the substring and we're iterating through the entire substring. So it would be like 2N, which just simplifies down to O of N. So it's a linear time operation. And of course, space complexity, in the worst case, the set just stores every single character in the substring or in parent string. Space complexity would just be O of N. So linear time, linear space. Could you use a substring instead of a set? I guess we, we could do that too, but it'd be like an unnecessary thing. Also, pop zeroing from string is, I believe, the O of N operation, that would make the entire thing like O of N squared. So we would massively increase the time complexity. Hey, it looks good. Thanks for your time. All right, awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for the interview. Yeah, I had a great time. 
Great, so that was Interview Coder in a technical interview. Um, I just showed you how it would look if you were in a LeetCoder interview. You sort of saw how quick it was and how the response times were actually capable of being handled in a live interview. And you also saw me take on a regular LeetCode medium. This is a common question that's asked in many technical interviews. And you saw how fast Interview Coder was and you saw how I was able to use it in real time with it going completely undetected. Now I'll show you how it works in a mock system design interview. Hey Abdullah, good to see you again. Hey Roy, good to see you as well. Yeah, okay, so I guess uh, we can just jump right into the system design interview or whatever you had in mind. Yeah, uh, I want you to design the Zoom, the okay. meeting software. Okay, that's pretty interesting. So I guess just design Zoom. Um, all right, then I, I guess I'll, I'll ask you some probing questions so that we can determine the scope of the problem. So I guess, do we want authentication here? Yeah, you should implement the authentication. And when I'm authenticated, what should I be able to do? You should be able to create meetings, be able to see your previous meetings. Okay, so just create a new meeting and see a list of my previous meetings. That makes sense. In the new meeting, like what exactly would be the mechanism for inviting people or having multiple people in the meeting? Yes, uh, you should be able to invite other people via a link or an email. Okay, so just to be clear, as a user, I'm able to authenticate. Once I'm authenticated, I'm able to create a new meeting. In that new meeting, I would get a URL generated based on the, I guess, the ID of the meeting. Based on that URL, I'd be able to invite people via email. So I would send them the same link, and then I would just authenticate based on whether they're invited or not. Yeah, you got it. Okay, yeah, sure. I'm happy to design something like this. What I'll do is I'll sort of talk about the core schema. And then once we're done talking about the schema and the types of DB designs that I'll do here, then uh, we can just jump into talking about maybe some of the API routes that we'll need. And if I need to update the, the schema after designing some of the core API routes, then, then we can do that. I'll try to keep things pretty minimal uh, just so that we can like finish up in the scope of the, the interview. Uh, yeah, uh, you just need to choose a minimal design. Okay, cool. The first thing that we'll need is a user's table. First thing comes to mind, we'll just store an ID, we'll store create it at, and we'll store an email. We'll store email and I guess password can be like a salted in hash password or whatever. I would imagine that we'd like largely rely on just an external authentication provider for us to do this. So personally, I would use something like, like WorkOS or OAuth or Auth0. Now that we have this user's table, we can have a meetings table because I guess user is pretty much the only thing they have is a meeting. So when you create a new meeting, first you're gonna need a meeting ID. So we'll have the meeting ID. We can base the invite URL off the meeting ID. So we don't need anything more than that. I guess we could have a, oh, we, we should have an owner, but I actually think it'd be cleaner for us to have a join table here instead. Why do you want to do a join table? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so I guess the reason that we would want a join table is when you're hitting a DB with this weird read, you have this long SQL query. Suppose that I wanted to go in and I want to find all the meetings that I was involved in, whether I was an owner or a participant. It'd be a lot easier for me to just read from a table with the primary key of my user ID. Like that would be much faster as opposed to just like filtering through all the meetings where owner ID is the same as my user ID because it's just not a primary key. Okay, so I, I'd have a join table here. This also, this also helps in the case that say there's like a million meetings that I'm in or just, just, just a bunch of historical meetings, um, then it would just help with performance a little bit. I also think it's just a cleaner practice. Okay, I'd have the meeting users table be a join table. The user ID should be the user ID for all the meetings I am an owner of. In an ideal state, I'd be able to log on and I'd be able to see not only the meetings that I created, but also the meetings that I was a participant of. Well, first, let me ask a clarifying question. Like, does it matter at all that we have um, this separation? Should I be able to see the meetings that I'm an owner of and the meetings that I'm a participant of? And should there be a distinction there? There should be no distinction. You should be able to see the meetings you created and you participated in. Okay, got it. We'll build it with that in mind. What I'd like to do is I'd like to have meeting user join table and I'd like to store the is owner or is participant column there. I guess actually just having that Boolean in there is perfectly fine. We can have it be non-primary and we can do the filtering client side. I'm just assuming that you probably wouldn't want to see maybe 10,000 meetings at the same time. So we have meeting ID, user ID, and this will be for every single meeting that I'm either an owner or participant of. So whether I create a meeting or join a meeting that I'm invited to or get invited to a meeting at all, and then uh, there would just be a new row created in the join table here. Is owner would be a Boolean or rather maybe it would have a owner ID. Owner ID is, is, is better. And then that could often repeat with the user ID depending on if I'm the person who created it. For now, let's say that's it. Actually, we'll have created at as a daytime field and also ended as another daytime field. And we can have that short duration as well. We can also have that be the state we use to manage whether a meeting is active. So a meeting would be active when it's created at, but there's no end 
that at the end. And the, the, the subtraction of those would be uh, the duration of each meeting. Great, I actually think that might be it. We can start designing routes now. We don't need much more in the meetings table given that all the logic is in this join table. So I guess we can start creating routes. I'm just gonna ignore the authentication step for now. Just assume that we're using a different auth provider and I'll get into the meat of the actual meetings logic. So when I create a meeting, what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm going to make a post request to the meeting. So I'll create a new meeting. I'll create a new row in the meeting user table and I'll have the owner ID be set to this user ID as well as the user ID, the primary user ID in the join table. That's all that would happen when I create a new meeting room. Then when I invite someone, we'll have like slash meeting slash invite. That would be another post request. And what we would do there is we wouldn't look for another meeting. We could throw in a check there to make sure that, that meeting actually exists, but we would more specifically check that the meeting exists. If the meeting does exist, then we'd add a new row to the meeting user join table that has my same owner ID, the meeting ID, and the user ID of the person that I'm trying to invite. So I guess we'll also have a function in there that sort of checks the email that sort of corresponds to the email and a user ID. And we can throw in an error state if the user ID does not exist or the email does not exist in our DB. And then I guess in the actual meeting, what we can do is we can sort of have like a streaming API. So we'll just have a single streaming route that will send audio bytes from my end to the server. So we can just open a socket in the meeting. We can have like slash meeting slash stream or whatever. And this will just be like an open streaming thing. I can send audio bytes via the streaming API and anybody else can send audio bytes via the streaming API too. I'm assuming that we don't want to save those in DB, correct? You shouldn't store the meetings content in the DB. That would be the huge privacy concern. Okay, sure. Yeah. So this will just be like an Omegle type chat room. That's temporary. We have socket logic then for just sending audio bytes over. We just create a room, send bytes to the same room and, and sort of spit them out with another streaming API so that we can all hear what everyone else is saying. And this will happen in real time because of web sockets. Do we want additional logic for if people who are invited actually join the meeting? Do we want to account for the state where people are invited but don't join? Uh, it's good. You don't need to consider anything right now. Okay, then we'll just leave that out of the discussion for now. There's one final state that we want, which is ending the meeting. So that, that'll be another post request. We can do, just do like post to meeting slash end and we'll check that the meeting is active. We'll have another check to see that the meeting hasn't is, isn't over. And then we'll just update the ended at in the meetings. And now when you're in the dashboard, you need one thing to be able to see all your meetings. So we'll, we'll have a get request to meetings. We'll, we'll paginate this so you don't actually like hitting the database with a million reads or however many meetings you have. Paginate this, we'll say 20 requests at a time. We'll split this up by pages. The page will be a number and it'll just be a parameter the URL when you fetch from pages, then you should get like, I guess your last 20 meetings and the meetings would be fetched by you'd look into the meeting user join table, find all the ones for which your user ID is a primary key. And you would conditionally on the client side, if your owner ID is the user ID, if that matches up, then you would just display like a little owner tag or something. And I guess you could also show all the other participants in the meeting, but I'm assuming that's not in scope. Yeah, uh, this design looks really good. Okay, cool. Is there any limitations? Yeah, yeah, I can talk about some limitations. Some of the most obvious things here are A, with the current implementation, you wouldn't be able to like save the transcript or save the audio of anything that was said in a meeting. That's a problem. The way that I would solve that is I would have the audio bytes or the streaming, whatever, get streamed into a service that actually like saves. Maybe maybe, maybe, maybe you could save the MP3 in a bucket that corresponds with the, the actual meeting. Or maybe we could convert the audio into a transcript via some, I don't know, speech to text uh, API. And then we could sort of like incrementally write to the DB. All that would really require is not another call limit in the join table that is the transcript. But I, I think that's like pretty tricky and really depends on which API you're using for speech to text here. Another limitation is that only authenticated users who have an account would actually be able to join a meeting. So for example, if I don't have an account, I'm just a guest and someone sends me like a Zoom URL here, then I'd have to create a Zoom account in order to join the meeting. That's a limitation. The way that we could work around that is in the users table, you would have another column for like actually has created an account. So theoretically, you could be like a user, but you could actually just be like a guest user, but you have an email. And if you don't exist in that table already, with an empty password. And the way that we check if you're a user is whether you have an empty password or not. This is pretty janky though, and I guess the implementation will actually depend on which auth provider that we choose to use here. The cleaner thing to do here is just to make a separate like guest table rather than having an existing users table. That way you could have guests join meetings as well. I think that covers most of the implementations. If you covered the first three steps that I said, then you'd be able to have like a transcript, be able to stream the audio bytes straight into that transcript. Either one of those saved somewhere in the DB and you'd be able to pull them and you could even like see them in the table or like in the dashboard when you first log in. Because we have pagination, um, you should be able to like see all of your meetings and you could even add filtering to the get request if you wanted to add more filtering. But right now there's not much filtering to be added. That pretty much covers it. Sounds good. A really great implementation. Thank you. All right. Uh, awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for the interview. Looking forward to hearing back from you. Yeah. Really nice talking with you. All right. See ya.